Good afternoon, and uh, welcome to this uh, edition of the Jones Seminar. Before I introduce the speaker, I want to let you know there was a bit of a hiccup with the food, because uh, 2 o'clock is the start time. It's a bit unusual, and there was some confusion about when the food would be delivered. So sorry about that. The food is not there. It's on its way, so it will arrive probably momentarily. I'll ask you to if you want any food or beverages, to do this discreetly in order not to perturb <laughs> the presentation uh, for, the, uh, for the speaker. Okay. Uh, today we have the great pleasure of having uh, Jane Hill with us. Uh, Jane obtained a Bachelor of Science Magna Cum Laude in Chemical Engineering from the Rensselaer uh, Polytechnic Institute back in 1995. I don't want to... Uh, oh, God, you, but, the uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> She has such a, a long record from that, that I thought I would start there. And uh, the following year, she got a master's degree in environmental management and policy, also from RPI. And then uh, she decided to embark on a teaching career and taught uh, as an assistant professor of chemistry at a community college in uh, the state of New York, and then as an adjunct professor uh, in environmental engineering at RPI. Then eventually she decided she liked that so much she would rather kind of up her game a little bit and decided to uh, obtain the PhD so she could teach at the university level. She went to Yale University and got a PhD in chemical engineering in 2006. And after serving one year as a postdoc there, uh, went to the University of Vermont where she took an assistant professor tenure track position to teach in a civil and environmental engineering, working at that time on phosphate uh, effluence in Lake Champlain, I believe, there. But on the side, she had this interest in biomedical engineering and managed to have a joint appointment with the medical school at UVM, and she turned attention to infectious diseases and metabolomics. I hope you're going to be explaining what that would mean. Uh, a few years later... She decided to come to the school, and she joined her faculty as an assist, associate professor now in 2013. And in addition to her teaching, she's re conducting research in a, it's a pretty active laboratory uh, where she, postdocs, graduate students, and undergraduate students develop rapid, non-invasive breath tests for the detection of infectious diseases of the lung. This is research that uh, has... Uh, obtained for her the Anton Anman Award from the International Association of Breath Research. And I suppose you're going to be talking to us about that research. But before giving the floor to Jane, I also want to add that in addition to her primary appointment here with us at the Thayer School, she enjoys a, an adjunct appointment in the Department of Biological Sciences and is the founder of Omeo Diagnostics, LLC, a company here in the area that... Uh, operates a bacteriological laboratory, and I've heard also this is not a first startup, so there's an entrepreneurship dimension as well. With this, let us welcome Thank Jane. Thank you for the very kind introduction. Is this reasonable? Can you hear me at the back? Great, thank you. I appreciate many of you coming, even though there's no food. I know that's often a draw card. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll, keep, I'll try not to have you be too cranky. Um, so if we think about human disease and how people diagnose um, disease, whether it's infectious or not, people have been thinking about that for a very long time. So this is Hippocrates, or um, you know, an, an image, of, a sculpture of him. And even in his day and age, physicians, as they were called um, then, would sort of sniff body emanations. And that means literally every kind of emanation that you might imagine, um, <clears throat> and sometimes taste those emanations. Uh, but they would um, also uh, sniff the breath. And in fact, it's written in this treatise um, of Hippocrates, but I don't know if, if any of you can read that, but it's, um, it's all Greek to me. That is a joke, and it doesn't get any better. Um, <laughs> um, but even in that, in that time, they could tell that there was something going on with the liver by smelling sort of fishy and sulfurous things that um, uh, come out in the breath. Um, and later on, of course, people figured out what these molecules were and, and published on them. 
Um, in, in my group, um, we're interested in biomarker discovery and clinical translation uh, devices into the clinic. Um, and we focus primarily on infections, although we do look at other diseases, so this is our mainstay. And we look at infections in the lung, the bloodstream, the urinary tract, and, um, and to a certain extent in the skin as well. Mostly we focus on infections of the lung. Why do we do that? If we look at the leading causes of death in the world, according to the World Health Organization, you can see some familiar things there. But you can also see that there are respiratory infections. So if you're in a, a low-income country, then the primary cause of death in adults and kids is uh, respiratory infections. And TB is separated out um, from that group, even though it's also predominantly a respiratory infection. If you look at lower middle income countries, then you have some of the things that we're a little bit more familiar with um, in the developed world. But you also still see um, infections that play a role um, in, uh, directly here, um, also indirectly through COPD, and TB shows up as well. And then the leading causes of death in the US are the things perhaps that you might be a bit more familiar with, so heart disease and cancer. Um, but chronic lower respiratory diseases still knock off a few people, um, as does influenza um, and pneumonias in general. So there's a reason why we're interested in respiratory infections. They are big killers um, here and elsewhere. So what are these organisms? There are a whole range of things you might have heard about already, things like influenza, H1N1, MRSA, uh, maybe even TB. Um, and I'm curious, um, who knows, and I know there are people from my class here, um, how you actually diagnose a lung infection. How do you do it? Oh, no one was expecting a question. <laughs> so yes, you like listen to the chest. Um, Sadie, what else? Um, you get a chest yep, you could get a chest x-ray. I think that might even be my next slide. <clears throat> but Sadie, and this is worth a grade. <laughs> No pressure. <laughs> Sadie's in a class of mine at the moment. Um, so does this tell you what the organism is? Can I tell if this is influenza? No. So what do you need to do? You may ask a friend. <laughs> yep. Can anyone help her out? Yeah, you need a sample. And, um, and that sample is typically sputum. So that's phlegm that we cough up. No pressure there, Sadie. <laughs> she was not expecting that. So you have to cough up a sample from the lung. Uh, and then typically that sample is grown in some kind of medium, in this case a blood agar plate. And then because we have to figure out a treatment option that's usually based on antibiotic susceptibility, there's a subsequent growth step where um, you might see its susceptibility to particular antibiotics as shown in this clearing assay. And that is pretty cool, except that is technology from the time of this guy. Bonus points if you're in my class and you can tell me who this is. Oh, bonus points. Who said it? Yes, it's Louis Pasteur, of course. Um, you may not have known, they all sort of look alike after a while. But this is Louis Pasteur, and we are using the technology of that time, right? So you're isolating, you're growing, growing takes a certain amount of time. So. How long does it take, then, to diagnose a lung infection? Got a sample, have to grow it. How long does it take? Any guesses? A few days, yeah. So depending on the bug, some bugs grow faster than others. It might take for methicillin-resistant staph to figure out its methicillin resistance, um, two to four days. Um, Pseudomonas, one of our favorites, a uh, few days. Um, if you're growing TB, three to five weeks. That's, that's if you know to expect TB. Usually trial and error takes several months um, in other places. But of course there are uh, more advanced technologies that are employed to do diagnostics. So it's not just that we only use the, the technology of Pasteur. We might be able to amplify nucleic acids directly from sputum. It's actually quite a technical challenge. Sputum is messy, has a lot of stuff in it. Um, so it can be difficult to pull out those nucleic acids um, uh, specifically, um, or we might be able to obtain a protein fingerprint um, as well. But even when we do apply these nucleic acid technologies or protein or proteomics approaches, we still usually have to grow the organism for a little bit of time beforehand to get enough mass to do that. So we might be able to reduce using these technologies 
our time to diagnosis down to half of what it was previously in the case of TB um, on the order of days. So that's pretty good, um, but I think we can do better. Um, in addition to that, um, the leading cause of death of kids under the age of five in the developing world is actually pneumonias and things, lower respiratory tract infections. And even though kids appear to all of us to be very snotty a lot of the time, they produce a lot of mucus, it's actually very difficult for them to produce a lower respiratory tract um, sample. Um, so often kids, if not almost all kids, uh, they can't produce sputum. And there are some diseases that are comorbidity factors or just happenstance that also make it difficult for even adult patients to produce that lower um, lung sample. For example, co-infection with HIV. And so what that means is, even if your technology is awesome and you can use sputum and get a result within an hour, which is not, uh, doesn't exist at the moment, you're still not able to diagnose some of the most vulnerable among us. It's just not good enough. So in my lab and others around the world who are working in the diagnostic area, we're interested in, in an ideal diagnostic. And I propose that what that might look like is it's something that's non-invasive, if possible, really fast. The phenotype is reflected. This is particularly important in infectious diseases where we might care about toxins or antibiotic resistance or how slimy something is. Um, prognostic, it'd be great to know how the patient might respond to a treatment. And potentially broadly applicable, at least to a group um, of folks who might experience a disease, if not the entire population that um, deals with the disease. And so the way that my team and I look at this problem, uh, one of the ways we look at this problem, is through um, anal analyzing the molecules that you might find in a patient's breath, sort of as a window to the entire body. And we hypothesize that there are molecules in the breath of the patient that are specific to the disease itself that is um, manifesting in the patient. Or put in another way, each organism will have a particular breath, a breath print um, that relates back to the infection. Now that may come from the host, it may come from the organism itself, or the interaction between the two in terms of what we see in the breath. So you're probably familiar with breath tests a little bit. Um, the alcohol breath test, I won't ask why. Um, you might be familiar with that one. But there are other breath tests, not a lot of them, if you look at the number of breath tests that have been approved by the FDA for different diseases. Um, this is the blood alcohol test. And the only infectious um, etiology uh, that you can find that's FDA approved is for Helicobacter pyroli. The original name for that was Campylobacter pyroli. Um, this is the stomach ulcer um, organism. So if you have that and you um, have a higher propensity for a stomach ulcer and potentially stomach cancer. Um, and that test works by ingesting um, labeled urea and then belching back out labeled CO2 and measuring that. But there are many, many organisms that are causing um, a huge problem for us. In this presentation today, even though we work on many of these, I'm going to focus on one, um, and you'll see why in the next slide. So TB, which some of you will be familiar with, either because you've talked with me or you're just aware, and others of us might think, wait a minute, TB is not a, like, not a thing for now. It's a, a disease of the past. Well, it is predominantly a lung infection, and believe it or not, it is the largest cause of infectious deaths in the world today, uh, more than HIV. Um, more than 10 million people are expected to be infected every year. That's an astonishing number, I think. Um, and here's an even more astonishing number. About a quarter to a third of the world's population have latent TB. That's TB that the body is controlling for a certain period of time, unless your immune system becomes suppressed. But it's hanging out there um, in some kind of uh, battle with, with your uh, host immune system. So typically, the question um, is, does a patient have TB or not? This is, again, as good as it gets. So, <laughs> um, Or perhaps um, it, you might be curious about whether someone has active or latent TB um, in a particular population. So how do you diagnose TB? As I mentioned, in general, for a respiratory infection, you have to cough up a sputum sample. 
um, where you might do some growth, as I mentioned before, which can take um, three to five weeks, typically um, three to four in an endemic setting. Or in some cases, you might be able to take a couple of sputum samples from the one patient. Not every patient can produce two samples, so that's important. Um, and kids can't produce any. And you might be able to do a nucleic acid amplification on that in order to do an ID. Um, if you do the nucleic acid amplification option, which is costly, even though it's subsidi subsidized rather by the WHO and other countries, uh, governments, um, you can get a result in days. Ostensibly, you can get a result within four hours. However, in practice, a patient comes into the clinic, the clinic collects the sample, and then the sample actually has to get sent somewhere else in a climate-controlled environment, and then the patient has to come back in a few days to get the result. Well, that may sound perfectly logical um, to us, but um, if you're in work or if you are in the classroom, you know, it's not terribly easy to sometimes go back and forth to get your medical uh, result. Um, and it doesn't necessarily come through a computer in the developing world, so to your email inbox. Um, so in South Africa, where we do a bunch of our work, um, it turns out that anywhere from 20 to 40% of patients who would be diagnosed with TB don't actually come back to the clinic to get their positive result. So it matters um, if you can give them a result on the same day. Um, and of course, in this uh, environment, kids are not diagnosed at all. So our goal in my group for this disease and for others is to have a very fast analysis to rule in or rule out a particular disease, um, in this case, um, TB. So why do we think breath will work for TB? It's a, it's a reasonable question. For all of the, the work in my group, for the most part, it's hypothesis driven. Um, and that hypothesis in this case is based on a few things. For example, if we look at blood transcriptional profiles um, in patients with TB, we can see a signature that indicates our body is responding to host, us, we're responding to that particular infection. Um, and actually I meant to orient you. Um, this is a, a breakdown of the types of people that were, the patients that were in this study, folks with active, latent, and those without TB. And we're looking at um, just a subset of genes that light up or uh, decrease their expression in the presence of disease or not. And so you don't have to know the details of this in order to recognize that there is a clustering of those genes um, for patients with active disease, as shown here. And so there are a number of these studies that indicate that the body is responding very particularly to a TB infection. And that uh, transcriptional profile looks different than other diseases or latent disease. But I think the most compelling data actually comes from this reasonably cute looking rodent, um, as far as rodents go. Um, this is a giant uh, pouched Gambian rat. And these rats you might have heard about in the past have been able to sniff out landmines. They can be trained to smell when a, where a landmine is and alert um, a landmine deconstruction person um, to that fact. When they made a call a few years ago to, uh, what, to the general public about what their um, next target should be, that target was um, TB um, by popular opinion. So it's a group that's based in Tanzania and Belgium. And what they did is they trained their rats to sniff um, a sputa that was positive, and uh, they got a reward for that. And then when they you know, sniffed the one that was negative, they didn't get a reward. I don't think they got a negative feedback, but no reward. And I'm just going to show you data um, from 2018 from this group. And I'll orient you to the slide. This is the percent increase by detection rats um, in diagnosis. And these are the age groups that are associated with um, their test. And I just want to point out that across all age ranges, we're seeing that adding rats that can sniff the sputa um, increases the ability um, for that group to diagnose TB in, in all of those age ranges. Um, and this is a, a, a summary of that slide in terms of uh, um, the data in a, a spreadsheet. Um, so these are the numbers you just saw a moment ago. And what I wanted to point out to you is that this is not just a few patient samples that they're looking at. They're looking at hundreds 
to tens of thousands of samples. So they've been able to show that there's something in the smell that these rats are sniffing in the headspace of that sputum cup that indicates that um, the patient has TB. They don't have any idea where it's coming from, from the host or the bug or something else, um, or some combination, I guess, but they know it's there. So those are two directional things that indicate that, that it might work for breath, because um, sputum obviously comes from the lungs. Um, but there also have been some small studies, um, including um, some of ours, that have actually looked at breath in small patient populations. I've just highlighted a few of them here from the major groups, where they've looked at usually 50 to 100 patients and seen that they can differentiate between those patients based on their breath. Now, 50 to 100 patients is not enough to be robust, but it's at least directional in terms of being promising. And so, taken together, um, we definitely think that we um, you know, have a good reason to pursue this avenue of, of work. So what does that actually look like? Um, as I mentioned, we hypothesize that there are molecules that come from the lung. They may come from circulating stuff that's going on immunologically. They may come directly from the um, epithelial cells in the lung as well as the organism. These molecules are collected and measured um, until we um, are able to use machine learning tools to come up with a diagnostic suite. And what we envision, potentially in some cases, actually might be a system that is bigger. Um, but I think what we envision ultimately is a system that looks like this. Obviously, this is a cartoon version of that. Um, there are lots of really great handheld technologies that once you know what the biomarkers are, you can apply um, uh, to the field. The work that we've done in my group spans, and still do in my group, spans a range of, of different types of things. We work both at the bench and growing things in the flask, through to animal models, and through to human um, clinical tests. I'm going to show you some work um, from my group done in macaques. Macaques are a really beautiful animal and a beautiful model for testing um, TB infection, vaccine um, testing, as well as antibiotic testing. Um, and we were able to uh, work with a fantastic group at the University of Pittsburgh. I'll flash their names up in a second. But essentially, we're able to anesthetize these animals for just a few minutes, collect free breathing breath into a Teflon lined bag that then gets drawn onto a sampling tube that has a matrix a little bit like your Brita filter, only um, smaller and a bit more scientific. Um, and we collect about a liter and a half of breath onto this tube, and then it's hermetically sealed and sent to my lab for analysis. Um, and these animals are infected or not infected with TB. They might have co-infections. They might be on treatments and whatnot. And we do this with a group um, at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, I'm going to present to you work that's mostly been driven by a former graduate student, now Dr. Uh, Ted Mellers from my group, as well as others in my group. Um, too. All right, so we don't have rats. Um, Joe would never let me bring an animal in to do this kind of work, which is probably reasonable. Um, but what we do have is shiny, cool pieces of equipment that ostensibly do a similar thing. This is a two-dimensional uh, gas chromatography time of flight mass spectrometer. All that to say, you have a way to introduce a sample, run it through a, a first dimension chromatography column, and then a second dimension chromatography column with orthogonal um, matrices that allows you to separate out the molecules <clears throat> to a great extent, um, and then followed by time of flight mass spectrometry. So time of flight you measure, and then you blast the molecule to get a fragment, an ID. So when we measure the breath of anybody, an animal or a human, or even above the headspace of a flask, we're often coming up with a whole lot of features that we measure. And I'll give you numbers, um, general numbers in a moment. And then we look at the unique um, features that are associated with, um, with all of the, the data set. We remove artifacts that might come from the plasticizers in the tubing that we use, that come from the column that we run our samples through. And then we do statistical analysis or machine learning. And so typically, we're looking at thousands of molecules, which we then uh, narrow down to 1,000 to 100, uh, in the hundreds, I should say. And then we do. Um, analysis on that to make things um, a little bit more workable. 
So in monkeys, um, we want to ask the question as both a proof of concept, and I'll express later on why it's actually important to do, uh, to have methods for preclinical applications as well. But in these monkeys, we have this question about TB or not. And in fact, I'll further say that we cared initially in this study about whether we could measure breath reproducibly. Like, if I take my breath today and then an hour later or the next day, like how similar is it um, to itself and then other versions of that kind of um, analysis? Can we distinguish between infected and healthy animals? Um, can we figure out from the breath print whether they're going to have a severe um, response, so they're going to have raging active disease, or whether it's going to become quiescent and latent, um, and then if we can track uh, treatment response. So in answer to the first question, if we look at um, narrowing down to the number of features we would consider in statistical analysis, in this case 384 features from the macaque breath, a range of some of your favorite functional groups, uh, for those of you who like chemistry, um, we found that across animals of the same group, so all healthy animals, that their breath was reasonably the same. A 0.71 Spearman rank is pretty good for a biological anything, um, especially across multiple animals on different days with different diets. Now, I imagine our breath would be a bit more variable because we all have different diets and different stuff going on in our bodies, but um, at least we can, we can measure um, in these animals and show that they're pretty similar. Um, so we, but there's more information on that if you, have, if you have questions. So the same animal had a higher spearmint rank, obviously, and then um, diseased animals had some variability. So this is you know, the most, next most critical question. So if we look at these animals, can we tell if they have an infection or not based on the molecules in their breath? So if we look at 22 animals, um, and we collected breath from them in the way that I mentioned, and we look at the total number of features, we remove contaminants, we look at some frequency of observation of features, so we try to pull things out of the noise a little bit by using a frequency of observation approach. And then in this case, I'm gonna show you, we selected features using the random forest uh, machine learning tool. And then we validate that on uh, breath from 19 animals. In, we're very lucky um, that we're not doing, able to just collect rather um, one breath sample from these animals. So every time before they were infected, we had usually a couple of time points where we collected technical replicates of breath. And then after they were infected, we were able to track their infection, uh, their breath, rather collect their breath, um, every, approximately every month for up to six months. So that's a reasonable data set, um, even though I draw your attention to the number of animals. That's a lot, actually, for a, a macaque study. Um, this is a principal component, um, excuse me, this is a, uh, and I'm going to show you area under the receiver operator curve um, with the true positive rate and one minus the specificity on the x-axis. And for this um, data set, we, um, there's a lot that happened between collecting the data, reducing it down, and then running it through machine learning, um, but we were able to come up with 12 molecules. Um, we also looked at some uh, random variables and random labels, which I'll explain in a moment. So that our area under the receiver operator curve was pretty reasonable at 89%. Not great, right, those of you in my class, but, but not bad as a first pass. And I just remind you that this is for animals who um, had an infection for one month, maybe six months. It could have been a raging infection, could have been a quiescent infection. Um, when a patient comes into the hospital, you have no idea how long they've had an infection. So you do need to be able to work with the heterogeneity of, um, of uh, when, how long someone has been infected. Now, based on the 80% frequency of observation, um, the random variables, so putting them into our model, um, random, uh, molecule, random features, rather, into the model, we still found that we had a pretty good separation with all um, of those um, all of, the, all of the things that we fed into our machine learning tool. But when we took random labels for the animals, we found that it tracked you know, reasonably across the 50% the, uh, line, 45 degree line, which is what we should get. Otherwise, we have some weird bias going on. Another way um, to look at the data, the same data, um, rather than AROC curve, is looking at hierarchical clustering. This is just the um, animal number um, and then the weeks post-infection. 
um, or pre-infection if it's a negative number. And you can see just visually, we can separate the animals out pretty well. If I put the, um, the information from the 12 molecules from random forest into a principal components analysis, you can see the clustering there. And if I look at a hierarchical clustering, excuse me, excuse me, predicted pro probabilities, um, then with some exceptions, um, we're reasonably able to tell if they're infected or not. So I think from this data, um, we can separate out things pretty well. We can do some more magic, statistical magic, to actually make these numbers look much, much better than this. But this is a more um, honest or conservative look at that data. So I think we're able to distinguish between infected and healthy animals. Um, what about humans? Um, so we have a number of ongoing studies um, looking at breath from patients with a variety of infections around the world. Um, but we have done a study um, in South Africa and Haiti specifically on TB, and we have an ongoing study on pediatrics in, in Cape Town. This particular uh, work that I'm going to show you was driven by folks in Johannesburg, along with um, these folks in my group, too. Oh, and Kali. Kali should be here on this one. Sorry, Kali. Um, this is a pilot study. Um, those of you who are familiar with clinical trials know that it takes quite a bit to get to the point where you can get a sample from a patient. So this was our first real study <clears throat> where we were experiencing what it takes to do that. We looked at 50 patients. Um, there was a mixed distribution, not an even distribution of those who had TB and those who didn't, a uh, mixed distribution of those who were smokers, and a mixed distribution of those who had HIV. Um, of course, we have to look at whether or not these mixed distributions, because most patients who had TB also were co-infected with HIV, we have to do statistical analyses to make sure that's not driving the differences we see in the data. So we do. Um, we do have, uh, we have conducted those kind of analyses. Um, but using 11 breath molecules um, and doing a test and training set, uh, excuse me, training and test set, um, we were able to distinguish between them. Now, this is 50 patients. Um, this is overfit. There is, um, this is merely uh, directional, indicating that we can collect breath from patients and we might be able to see a difference. Um, so I'm not going to pretend that we have the magic biomarkers for a TB for humans just on 50 patients. Just to give you a sense of um, the types of things that we do do with our data, however, um, these were the features that we detected all the way down to removing sparse features. In this case, we use a 50% cutoff for frequency of observation. Um, <clears throat> that's still reasonably conservative amongst our peers. Um, and then we do um, all sorts of um, machine learning approaches in order to come up with those discriminatory features. In this case, I showed you the result from Random Forest, which has become one of our favorites because of how good it, it performs. Um, and we, of course, do a lot of analysis of what those molecules are. Um, so we use all, all sorts of um, machine learning approaches to figure out our biomarkers. Um, but what about this? Can we ask a more nuanced question about determining the difference between severity of an infection and maybe the trajectory of severity? So if you were to determine the severity of an infection, um, you, would do, um, you uh, would do a PET-CT analysis of their lungs. This is a very big, very expensive piece of equipment. Um, but it is kind of the gold standard for determining severity, and you look for how bright these spots are at the in the tubercules of the lung. You might also, whoops, should show up. No, oh, didn't. Hold on. Uh, these are reversed. Okay. Um, you can also look at transcriptional profiling. So you can look at uh, from a sample of blood what the transcripts are doing um, to make that determination as well. But this is the gold standard. You take image images. Um, I remind you that severity is important not only for those folks who have TB, but also for the 25% to 30-odd percent of folks who have latent TB. And it may not seem like it's a problem because they have uh, control of their infection. At least, you know, they don't have control, but their body is controlling it. Um, however, as populations get older, or people come down with something that suppresses their immune system, which is reasonably easy to do, then it can reactivate. 
So now imagine even if a small percentage of the human population every year reactivates, that is a very large number as, as our um, lifespan length uh, extends. Um, OK, so in our monkeys, um, we have access to PET-CT data. Um, and so this is just a larger version of that. And those of you who do imaging will be quite familiar with this approach. And we were first asked by our collaborators to see if we could correlate breath with um, the lung avidity score, the inflammatory score. So we looked at 12 animals, and we had lung avidity scores for those animals um, at different time points. This is the lung avidity score. And uh, Ted was tasked with figuring out if we could predict the severity of the disease um, based on the breath. So if you can predict it, you'll see um, that everything tracks along a 45 degree line. And these are the animals. So this is what we found. Now, this is, again, a conservative look at the data. And I'll, I'll give you a reason for why I still put it up here. So the correlation of 0.8 is actually really good for this kind of data. It's driven, of course, by this cluster. And there's a whole lot of dots underneath these visible dots. Um, that are driving this, because if you look at these, it's not that good. Um, you could split this up into two curves that have a much stronger correlation, and that's perfectly reasonable to do. But we were perplexed particularly by these, um, these points, like what was going on with these particular animals. So when we took a closer look at the data, it seemed that this animal was a breath, had a breath print that was taken earlier than these animals. So let's say this was at one month after infection, um, and these were all in the subsequent months beyond that, um, where we were collecting the breath. So I thought that was interesting. Um, and then we thought, well, maybe what's going on is we might be picking up something a little bit earlier than the PET-CT imaging. Um, and indeed, um, that idea was supported by looking at these animals, which were also at earlier time points um, as well. So can we predict um, infection outcome? And so again, we're going to use as a basis of gold standard the PET-CT imaging and lung avidity scores specifically. When we look at our animals and we look at the lung avidity score and separate them into those who have a raging infection and those who have a latent infection, the segregation of the animals looks like this. Now, we also have animals that have an intermediate phenotype. So I want to be completely honest and reveal that those um, Oh, not showing up very well. But those show up in between the high and the low severity. So these definitely are latent animals. These are probably on their way to latency, but are not there yet. And these are raging active, and these um, potentially are going up there as well. So we're looking at a prediction of infection outcome. We're looking at a 12-week time point. The gold standard for this is PET-CT image, imaging, and the gold standard time to do that is at 12 weeks. So that's why we chose that point. Um, and we came up through looking at the breath um, uh, and using random forest again with 10 breath molecules um, at this three month or 12 week time point. Again, this is going to be an area under the receiver operator curve. And for discriminating animals that were at that high severity raging infection versus those who were completely latent, um, we were able to do that really well 91% um, area. And uh, and the average class probability, if I reflect that here, um, we were able to, to separate them out quite beautifully. Um, if we look at all animals, um, and there should be a line that shows up, here we go, um, then actually the model was pretty good based on the model we derived from looking at the high and the, the low severity animals. So not trying to fudge the data at all, but just using those two um, data sets to, to create our model. So not, not bad, actually. And if we look at that in terms of the average class probability, you can see that there's misclassifications, um, as you would expect for an 84%. But still, if you are undergoing um, a clinical trial of a vaccine or you're evaluating the efficacy of a drug in either monkeys or in humans, then having some reasonably um, diagnostic breath test that doesn't cost as much, that doesn't irradiate you, um, is very, very useful 
Um, so we're working on preclinical and post-clinical trial applications. Speaking of uh, clinical application, both preclinical and, and beyond, um, we were also had access to some data that looked at treatment response. So if we um, look at our model of high severity, this is that model um, superimposed onto a principal components analysis. This is our high severity group and our low severity group. Um, so one misclassification for, the, uh, for that model. And we looked at some animals that were underwent um, antibiotic therapy. Um, this is what we saw. We saw that each of these three animals, after they went on standard anti-TB treatment, their breath print changed from a high severity print to a low severity um, breath print. It's three animals. You can't do anything with that information. This is just suggestive that we might be able to track how effective a treatment is by looking at uh, these 10 molecules in the breath. So in terms of TB or not, um, there's a few different ways we've uh, looked at that in the, in the, uh, in the animals. Um, and these is some, just some different ways of displaying that data. We've looked at, do they have TB? Is it active, raging infection or not? Um, can we look at the breath and see if they're responding to treatment? Um, so we have an ongoing clinical study right now in South Africa. It's still very small. We've um, got about 120 patients enrolled. And we're able to look at those patients uh, before they go on treatment with a gold standard um, analysis of, of whether or not they be classified as T having TB or not. And then we're able to track those patients over a year and look at whether or not we can see antibiotic response. Um, now, why is this important? Anybody here, how no, lo, ha, blah, blah, blah. Anybody here know how long you have to be on treatment if you have just regular susceptible, drug susceptible TB? One year? Eh, for, you can get away with six months. If you have horrible, like, multi-drug resistant TB, it's 18 months or more, and you're probably going to die anyway, which is horrible. So that's, anyway, that's not necessary. Um, so some patients may respond earlier. They may actually clear the infection at four months. And some patients may need six months, and some patients actually may need much longer than that. But right now, everybody just goes on um, six months. Sometimes people feel better after a month, um, so they go off treatment, and then that's how you might get multidrug resistant cases to, uh, occurring and so on. So it's actually quite important to be able to just track, not only to diagnose, but to track um, how well you're responding to treatment. <coughs> All right, I have this picture here because I wanted to remember and say that we work with these large systems and they're really awesome, very good for biomarker discovery. But we're quite interested in working with miniature systems as well. And so we have a collaboration with Sandia National Labs where they have this system, which is really like this big, um, that is a handheld two-dimensional gas chromatography system with a sensor on it to, um, to measure the amount of biomarker. So we've just started that collaboration over the last several months, um, and um, I'm excited about what we could do with that, both preclinically and clinically. Um, so I've given you a sense of what we do um, with, with breath and the hypothesis-driven reasons for why I think it'll work and some data that's suggestive. Um, but I, I, we've learned, I should say, so it's more of a we, but my personal opinion is that when you're developing a diagnostic, you can't necessarily ignore all the other things that are known already or might be being developed. So symptoms, symptoms are useful uh, that you put in your diagnostic al algorithm that's freely available information. But there are also orthogonal approaches to diagnosing that might enable you to get your area under the receiver operator curve to be higher. And so one of the current things that we're, um, ooh, headless um, person uh, doing in the lab is now looking at orthogonal approaches, so breath and other things, in order to improve our ability to rule in or rule out a particular disease. And so we're considering actually the transcriptional profiling, so taking a blood test. You can run that now very quickly in terms of looking at gene expression on a handheld system in the clinic. And combining that, that should show up as breath. And that combination um, to give us an even better ability to diagnose infections. So I'm just going to spend 
uh, this portion of my presentation um, talking briefly about that approach, because I think it's really cool. So we're looking now at um, ultimately collecting our own data. But this, what I'm going to show you now is a framework that's uh, driven by Kali, but back in my group, that's looking at publicly available data sets of transcriptional um, profiles um, and using that massive amount of information to come up with a signature, uh, sort of a data mining approach. So remember that we have these transcriptional profiles um, that are available. You can download this information um, at will. And you can get information about the study subjects. For example, um, if we look at these different um, submissions, we find that in this submission, we have a number of TB patients, latent TB patients, patients on treatment, healthy controls, and other diseases. So these are, most, for the most part, reasonably well-designed um, studies. They have a range of ages, geographic origins, there's about 1,100 uh, samples, so now we're getting a decent N. And they have culture-confirmed TB. That's actually quite important. Um, but let's say Dr. So-and-so over here conducts a study with this geographic um, population and these study design criteria and objectives, and somebody else has different, slightly different geographic regions, public, uh, excuse me, demographics. Um, using its different instruments to do their profiling, uh, different data cleaning procedures. It's all a mess, right? So often the data sets don't talk to each other very well, and there's very little overlap that one can glean from just looking at them directly. So Kali's been developing a pipeline um, that allows us to pull data from these databases, uh, in this case, uh, the four data sets that I mentioned, um, pull them all into one uh, uh, one spreadsheet, I guess you could call it, with lots and lots of care taken to make sure that this gene really is the same as that gene that's measured in the study. Sometimes they have different names and you have to align those things. It's very tedious. We have three master students working on this, have been working on this for months uh, to help us out with that. We then, um, or rather Kali um, and her team, uh, takes the data and splits it into two. We look at the healthy controls to give us a sense of the variability that you might expect in a general population. And then we <clears throat> use a Bayesian estimate um, to, a uh, Bayesian framework, excuse me, to come up with a distribution that we then co-normalize all of our other data, which we know has a bias. It's either TB or another disease um, uh, or someone on treatment. So we co-normalize the data until we come up with uh, a final data set that we are then comparing apples and apples with-ish. So this is what the data look like projected onto a principal component now, so you can see the amount of variance that's explained. It's um, like it's horrible. Um, the only two studies that are falling on top of each other, this is four studies, one, two, three, and four. Um, these guys use the same platform to do their gene expression. Um, the others use a different platform, and when you do this, approach, and then you can co-normalize the data, you have a reasonable overlap, and now you can start to do analyses. So I mentioned the types of analyses that we do um, in my group, a whole lot of different modalities. Uh, these are some of our favorites, uh, support vector machines, uh, partially squares discriminant analysis, and random forest. But basically, what uh, in this example, subset example, um, we have split our data up into training and validation steps. Um, we're interested in these three machine learning approaches. We do some cross-validations with repeats. We look forward and back to get our feature selection. Um, we have final models for each of the machine learning tools. And then we look at the class probabilities to evaluate how good they are. So if we look at these genes, which were pulled out um, by one of the machine learning approaches, um, and look at those that are the most important, and then we have a measure to figure out which ones we're going to include. So 1 minus the root mean squared, the area under the curve, and the accuracy, which is a sensitivity and specificity measure. Um, that combination allows us to then kind of evaluate how good each approach is. So PLSDA, um, SVM, and random forest. And so we're measuring, uh, we're looking at training, validation, and then overall weighted um, overall average, accuracy, sensitivity, specificity area. These are a bunch of numbers, um, but basically, uh, random forest performed the best in all of these measures, as I mentioned before, with the worst um, looking at sensitivity on the validation set. Uh, 
Uh, but if we're looking for specificity or uh, positive and negative predictive value, it actually is quite effective. If we look at this um, in terms of the area under the receiver operator curve, so just a graphical representation, um, and a comparison of these machine learning approaches, um, you know, random forest usually does well. We've got some overfitting issues um, in this data set that we're um, f much further along with now. And then specifically, if we look at how this plays out for the patient data, um, so this is, uh, these are the genes that we think are predictive of TB versus other disease, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and all of those data sets now combined, we can see yeah, it's not by any stretch perfect, but we can definitely see clustering in the data indicating that we may have a transcriptional profile for um, TB. So how do we compare to probably the main person that's doing this out at Stanford, um, Pravesh Khatri? When he did his meta-analysis framework, which inspired our work, um, he got pretty good um, numbers for control patients versus TB, um, TB patients versus latent, and TB patients versus other disease. These are, these are actually really good numbers for a three-gene uh, data set. Um, we uh, uh, looked at a uh, step before the current results, and we were able to improve those values um, by doing some, some different types of approaches. And then our current results allow us to have really stupendous um, discrimination between the different groups that we're interested in. Well, you can also use this data to generate hypotheses. So we're really, really driven toward thinking about diagnostic applications and monitoring. Um, but you might imagine that there's a whole lot of biological information in this data as well. And so we're working now with other groups who know how to think about uh, what's going on in the host um, much more effectively than we can. And uh, we've not only recapitulated a lot of the data that they, the results rather, that they've come up with, but there's even some suggestion in this data of new things that are driving um, new work, which is very exciting. So I've presented to you kind of an overarching um, one example of TB in my group. We work with a whole lot of other different organisms um, and, and animal models and human patient models. When I came to Dartmouth, we were at this stage. Um, we are now um, much more driving toward the clinical um, stage in terms of uh, biomarker validation. Um, I do want to take a pause here, as I mentioned before, and say that there are preclinical applications to some of this work now. So in some of the animal models we work with, these are the models that are used to actually test vaccines and to test um, drug treatment regimen. And so having a non-invasive way, rather than killing the animal and chopping up its lungs in order to figure out um, you know, how many bugs have been killed, um, if we can do that in a non-invasive way, that saves a lot ethically and monetarily. Um, each animal in a macaque study like this costs $30,000. Um, so that's not a small amount either. So we, we are uh, working on some preclinical um, applications and, of course, the, the clinical applications in uh, pediatric and adult TB. We have tons of studies um, going on all over. Um, and this is a, a list of some of the organisms we focus on or disease populations. We have hundreds of patients now, um, I think maybe 500, 600 patients in a CF study. We've got a ventilator-associated ammonia study. We have flu studies, multi-drug resistance studies, um, et cetera. The work that I've shown you here today was driven by this group, um, which includes a whole lot of fantastic collaborators from other places, as well as my team and a whole bunch of people who have now graduated. Kali's the lone person that's still here. And then my current lab members, these are the uh, more senior folks, and then we have some master's students and a bunch of undergrads in the lab, and we're, we're funded for this work by these, these groups. Um, and then, ooh, that, let's change that color. Um, and this is the uh, full extent of the folks we work with in other areas as well, and the remainder of the funding organizations. And with that, I think I'm at time, and I will leave you with that and see if there are any questions.